Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking with a man whose barbecue has become synonymous with food festivals all up and down the East Coast. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. Today we're going to be talking with Andrew Don Patterson from Black Iron Smokers. Now if you are on the East Coast, you will have seen him before, I almost guarantee it. But we're going to find out a bit more about him later on. First up, I've got a couple of announcements that I do need to run by you. First up, winter is coming. That's an original line I know, I just thought of that, I don't know where it came from. But to help you out, we do have our hoodies and our beanies available for you. Nice and thick and warm. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. Check them out. Um, They are some good gear. Next up, Barbicon is coming. Keep the weekend of the 26th and 27th of June free. We are putting on, Smoking Hot Confessions is putting on, the world's first virtual barbecue conference. So it's going to be two full days of just uh, fantastic barbecue knowledge and entertainment. We're going to be jumping into the different backyards of different pit masters, pit builders, um, all sorts of different people, and we're going to be sharing their knowledge with all of you in your lounge room. So the Saturday is going to be all about cooking barbecue. We're going to be jumping into some different competitors' backyards, finding out how they like to cook all their different foods, and then the Sunday is going to be all about the businesses of the the, the, the businesses, that was good, the business of barbecue. So we're going to be looking at things like branding, building your businesses, all that sort of stuff. So we're going to be covering all the aspects of the barbecue industry. So that's coming up June 26 and 27. Keep that free. I'm going to be starting to contact um, some potential presenters soon. So keep an eye on the socials as I start being able to, to announce who's going to, be, uh, who's going to be joining us on that weekend. Next, if you are just at the beginning of your barbecue journey, do head on over to the Smoking Hot Confessions website, smokinghotconfessions.com. We have a free ebook available for you. It's our beginner's guide to real barbecue. And what that is, that's a short ebook. It's everything that you need to know to get you started on the right track to beat boredom and make the most delicious food you've ever had in your life. Because there's two problems that face barbecuers. One is bad food and the other is being bored with what they're already doing on the grill. So that's our goal with that ebook. And it was recently awarded at the NBBQA um, annual excellence awards over the United States. It won second prize for um, for writing. So it's a great bit of gear. Get over there. It's completely free. Smokingyourconfessions.com. And if you are on Facebook and you are joining us live now, I can see we already have a bunch of people um, who's joining us live. We've got Chad Griffin here from uh, down in Canberra. He says he loves his hoodie. Thanks, Chad. Uh, he's able to join us live because he's a part of the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community on Facebook. That's a group where we do these live podcast recordings and it gives the members of that group the opportunity to participate in the show. They can write their comments, they can write their questions and I can put those questions to the uh, to our guest during the show and we can get, you, uh, get all your questions answered. We can get you sorted. And uh, it's completely free to join. There's no uh, catches. And it's just the nicest little part of the internet to come hang out. And unlike a lot of groups, um, you know, we do just talk about barbecue. We don't get carried away with all the rubbish. All the guff is left at the door. We're very inclusive. We welcome everybody to it. And we would love to see you there. Now, if you are watching this uh, podcast video later on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, a subscribe, and hit that little notification bell. If you're watching on Facebook, it's the thumbs up, it's the share, it's the comments, and make sure you're following us as well. If you're watching this on IGTV, we do love those cute little love hearts and give us a follow as well. And of course, if you're listening on a podcasting app, particularly Apple Podcasts, you need to give us a five-star rating and review, please. It was very helpful. Um, It has helped us to do so many different things. Um, You may have just seen us on the news yesterday. Uh, our, Our podcast did very well in the United States. and um, that's part of that is because of these five star ratings and reviews because that drives us up the charts and helps share it. And in the past 30 days, we have been as high as position number six in the US in the food category. Now, what a lot of people don't realize, and I'm going to try and just get through this quickly, is that the podcasting platforms will promote local content over international. So for an Australian podcast to get to number six in the American charts, That's kind of a big deal, and we owe that to all of you. So thank you very much for helping us out with that. Now, coming up today, 
we do have Andrew Don Patterson, as I said, from Black Iron Smokers, and he's got that pit, The Gangster. Now, if you did catch the last episode that we just released uh, earlier today, actually, given the magic of time, we're recording this on the same day that the last one was was published. Um, it's A Giant Silver Creek by Paul Reitmeyer. So we're going to find out more about that trailer a bit later on, and we're going to talk about his uh, his business and all the different things that he does there as well. Now, just to answer this quick question that's come through, are you live, Ben? Yes, we are live right now. This is the live podcast recording. So if you are watching this live, do put your comments and your questions in, especially your questions, and we will get them answered by Andrew. So speaking of Andrew, let's get him in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Andrew, long time no see, my friend. It's good to have you in the confessional. Hey, Ben. How you doing? Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Anytime, mate. Anytime. Now, I think I last saw you was at Kangaroo Valley 2019, I think. That'd be about right. Yeah, that'd be about right. Yeah, long time, long time. Now, we're going to get into the competition scene shortly. Now, I always kick off every episode by asking people what was the last thing that you barbecued. Now, you are a barbecue uh, vendor. And so I know you cook a lot of barbecue. So I'm going to tweak the question just a little bit. What was the last yep. thing that you cooked for yourself? Um, on the barbecue, it would have been, gee, now you're pushing me. <laughs> we, did some prawn, we did some prawn skewers about three weeks ago on the Kamado. Um, I sell a lot of barbecue, but I don't eat a lot of barbecue, which would surprise a lot of people. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I'm an English teacher by day, so I, I love to use bad grammar once I'm out of the classroom. So, <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I, I certainly understand what you're saying there. Now, you mentioned that you have a Kamado. So is that your, your favorite pit to cook on when you're at home for yourself? That's the I, – I call it my – if I do a barbecue class, I call it my set and forget pit. So if I want to go shopping or if I want to mow the lawn or if there's a whole heap of things that I want to do, but I still want some beef rib or I want a pork rib or I want a chicken or whatever it might be. I can literally set that up, close the lid, walk away and know that I'm going to come back in two, three, four, five hours. It's, it's just going to look after itself. Yeah. I, I hear that a lot from, uh, from those Kamado style um, uh, owners that they, they, they really love them for exactly that reason. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether it's rain and windy. I've got, the guy who got me into the Kamados actually works with me in my day job and he lives in Nashville, Tennessee. And he sent me a photo of his big green egg sitting in 16 feet of snow and two feet of ambient air around it going, I'm cooking a brisket. And I said, <laughs> what's the temperature outside? He goes, I don't know. I'm sitting in my den. He said, with a bourbon, he said, it's probably 16 degrees Fahrenheit outside. He said, but it doesn't worry the egg. 16 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just trying to do the math in my head. That's, that's below zero. About minus six. Yeah. Wow. Forget that. Ugh. Much too cold for me. But that is a real yes. tribute to that. You to that. Yeah. 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 That is a real tribute to that, uh, to that type of barbecue. Now you mentioned that, um, that the fella from Tennessee got you into Kamado's. How did you get into barbecue in the first place? Was it something that you grew up with or something you discovered um, through the miracles of the, of the internet? How did you come to the world of barbecue? Um, if I went right back, anything that I could set fire to from the age of five through to about 12, I pretty much did. Um, I grew up in Coffs Harbour. The lady next door had a chicken coop and she was forever piling rubbish up and she said, if you want to burn that, that's cool. And I'm like, hey, I'm six. I've got a box of matches. Let's do that. At age so six. It, <laughs> yeah, so it kind of started like that. And then the whole barbecue thing was I was a typical Aussie. I was burning sausages on a gas gas barbecue for years and years and years. Um, joined the Aussie Barbecue Forum before things like Facebook and everything else popped up. And... Um, uh, actually went to Jay Beaumont's first event in 2014 as a spectator. So I read all about it and thought, let's go and have a look at what this low and slow thing is all about. And as they say, the rest is history. Yeah, right. So you've been involved in the, in the competition scene then in, in one way or another since, 
the competition scene started in 2014. Yeah, so we had a look at the oh, – I said to Alinka, I said, let's, let's go. And it would be remiss of me to say that I'm a black iron smoker without Alinka because black iron smokers were a husband and wife barbecue vending company. Um, so we headed to Port Macquarie, met the half a dozen teams, maybe the dozen teams that Jay had for the first year. Had a good look around. I said to Alinka, we're going to compete next year. And with those of us who have wives, you know that look of like, we're going to do what? Yeah. So I, said, I know well, it let, well. Let, yeah, let, let's give it a crack. So 2015, we turned up with a Park Tri-Fire, a Daniel Boone pellet grill, a Weber, the smallest tent you've ever seen in your life. No idea on that we had, the fact that we had to cook all night and sleep outside all night. <laughs> um, but run second in brisket and thought this is a this is really good and more to the point um met a whole heap of people that started that barbecue community and that's what it's that's what keeps us in what we do it's the people in this barbecue community yeah absolutely it is yeah that was quite the collection for the first ever barbecue comp just, just run me through all those different barbecues again so i had a stick burner so i had a hot park tri fire yep and then i took a weber which I don't think we actually, oh, yes, we did. We used it to cook dinner. We did chicken wings. And then we had a Daniel Boone pellet, pellet grill, which was given to me from um, Nick Angeluski from Barbecue Aroma, and he said, go and give that a try. So wow. what I did was I ran two sets of proteins, two brisket, two pork, two ribs, two chicken, et cetera, one lot in the stick burner, one lot in the, in the uh, pellet grill and we picked the best protein at the end and handed them in in the box as you do. Oh, wow. Nice one. And, and you picked up second in brisket. I don't think there was anyone more shocked on the park in Port Macquarie than the <laughs> and I that day. Because they're yeah, down from yeah. 10 down to one and we're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, that, that's okay. We didn't expect to go anywhere. And then someone said, black iron smokers second in brisket. And I looked at Alinka and she looked at me and I'm like, um, hang on, that's us. So, uh, yeah, off we went. I actually know exactly that feeling. That's exactly the feeling that I had in 2018 in that same park when they were calling out the team name that I was a part of then as well. It's that, mm -hmm. wait a minute, hang on. What? What? Did you yeah, hear that? Double tap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So was that the moment for you when you discovered, like, this is what I want to do? Like, when you got called up and you got that, that second place brisket trophy, was that, was that when it clicked? Ben, I, I think for me, to be honest, it was the year before 2014. Um, and I'd watched like everyone had on all sorts of different um, YouTube and TV, the competition scene in the US. And you now everyone says, oh, now with the gangster, gee, it looks like a, a, it looks like a train. I was always into, I didn't, I, not that I didn't understand, but I was always fascinated by a traditional flow offset barbecue. So the first one I actually saw in the flesh was a um, was a Yoda 24 inch that Dave Sprigg had in Port Macquarie, and as they say, the rest was history. I thought this thing is just super cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you were hooked, Len, like right from the first time. But like, it yeah, was love at first pretty sight. Pretty much. Pretty much. Oh, I just got a great pun. Are you ready for it? Yep. It was love at first bite. No, oh, there Whoa. we go. <laughs> oh, I'm on fire tonight. Absolutely on fire. Um, so now one thing that, that I do know about you is that, um, well, first of all, we get a lot of people on this show who are, who are Weber collectors. Um, I, I've got, I think oh. I'm up to about six now myself. Now you go a little bit bigger in what you're collecting. Tell us what you're collecting. I collect Silver Creek stick burners. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. It, it sounds really bizarre, but when I was, I was looking through the internet to buy a stick burn and Olinka walked past me one night and she said, one day we're going to own one of those. And the page was open at Silver Creek, Paul Wrightmeyer, and it was a Lone Star, which is one of his smaller offset stick burners with two chimneys. And she said, we're going to own one of those one day. And I sort of looked at her and I thought, Okay. Well, as they say, that 
That Lone Star and a pit that he's got called a Longhorn are the only two in his range that we don't have. Right. So I've got his El Grande Reverse Flow, which is a beautiful little pit which sits up on my patio, which I use fairly regularly. And then I've got a Silver Creek Iron Age, which came from a um, barbecue restaurant in Melbourne, which I actually drove down and picked it up and brought it back. And wow. then I've got a 24 inch by eight foot with a warmer, vertical warmer, very similar to your radar hill on the end of it, which was the actually the second trailer pit ever built in this country. So Paul built Jack the Ribber. Yep. And then he built what I call Lazarus because when we bought it, it had been <laughs> sitting under a eucalyptus tree for four years. And if anyone wants to look at our Facebook page and see where, where it was from then to where it is now, they'll understand why I call it Lazarus. Um, I remember the conversation pretty well. I'd commissioned Paul to, to build me an Iron Age, which I've got in the garage next door to me. And I rang him up and I said, the money for the Iron Age is gone. And there was a bit of silence on the end of the phone. And he said, I can imagine. Where's it gone? And I said, are you sitting next to your phone? He goes, yeah. I said, I'll send you a text. And he went, oh, that's cool, brother. That's cool. He goes, wow. He said, it didn't look like that. He said, when I built it, he said, I'll send you a photo of what it was like when it was new. And so I restored it pretty much back to what it was when he built it. And it's sitting very lonely at the moment in Coffs Harbour in a shed under my father's joinery shop, but it's up there and it cooks beautiful barbecue. Yeah, that's a, that's then, a real course, piece I've, of Australian I've, barbecue history, isn't it? Correct. And then, of course, I've got the gangster, which is parked on the driveway, which is um, one of the biggest pits he's, he's built on a trailer today. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful bit of gear, that, that gangster. Um, I've, I've got a ton of questions about the gangster too. The one thing that I did want to ask, I forgot to ask yep. Paul about his um, – uh, tailgate smokers. Do you have one of them? No, I did see that come up on your your page the other day. So I did comment to that that hey, I've got four Silver Creeks now. What's five between mates? Um, so that is it's something that, in all honesty, that I could probably use because if you do just want to go away somewhere for a weekend, even if you're taking the bride away and we're going to go away and just have a nice weekend away from catering and doing whatever we do. If you still want to grill a steak or if you want to cook, you know, smoke a chicken or do whatever, you can just pull that. I can pull that out of the back of the range and go, cool, got a Silver Creek I can travel with. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. I'd, I'd love to know um, if we're allowed to actually travel with it mounted or if we have to, like, pull it off and store it and then pull it out and mount it when we want to use it. Uh, funny story. I was traveling with the gangster to Mittagong to do a brewery that we frequented down there. And I've swung into Mittagong and you try not to travel with live fire because you do get in trouble for that. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I had, had a few coals in the back of the gangster. I thought, yep, that's cool. So I've come from Liverpool to Mittagong, which is about 70 odd K. And a highway patrol pulls in behind me in Mittagong and oh. follows me into the brewery. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the car going, okay. So I got out and this police officer gets out and he walks up to me and he goes, I've only got one question for you. And I thought the question's obviously got to be, why are you traveling with live fire? Because there's a little bit of smoke ticking out. Ah, uh, right. And he goes, what is it and where do I buy one? Oh. So I said, well, that's actually, I said, that's actually two questions. So he said, I'm going down the police station. I've got to drop somebody off. So he came back and probably had 25, 30 minutes talking to us about barbecue in general. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I... I'd, I know that we're not allowed to travel with, with live fire, but I'm curious to know because we are a bit of a nanny state here in Australia, whether we'd be allowed to travel with an unlit um, mounted on the tow bar tailgate smoker. I just well, don't know how. mum and dad that go up the highway with 13 bikes that hide the number plates. So really, is it any different? Well, that's true, yeah. And I, I, I guess you do see people with, you know, dirt bikes and things that weigh 120 kilos hanging off the back of their, yeah. their, their trucks. and that. Yeah, good. Good point, good point. I'm going to have to talk to Paul. We'll just put one on your car and see how you go. Mate, I'm all for that. I'm all for yeah. that. <laughs> so, so tell us about the Don. Let, let's talk the Don. Sorry, not the Don, the gangster. the gangster. 
Ooh, I'm in trouble. Not the Don. I apologize. The gangster. You dug that hole a bit deeper, didn't you? I did. Um, Did I say the Don before? Yeah, you did. Oh, I did. Ah, sorry. Um, The gangster, long story short, I built my original barbecue pit, which was a 24 inch by six foot with a square firebox. And I had a conversation with David Close in Texas with regard to barbecue pits. Now, it would be remiss of me to say that Paul Reitmeyer and David Close, who I have spoken to at length about building barbecue pits, have forgotten more than I'll ever know about barbecue. But the one piece of information that Dave Close gave me on the phone, being the eccentric character that he is, he said, I hope you built the pit three times bigger than what you think you need. And me being an Aussie, I thought, yeah, mate, what, you know, whatever. He was dead right. So I, I, I built the 24 <laughs> inch by six foot. Within six months, I'm like, this hasn't got enough real estate in it. So we took it off the small trailer, mounted it onto a larger trailer, and then put a 36 inch square upright stick burner next to it. Did a couple of events. Still wasn't enough real estate. So sold those and commissioned Paul to build the gangster. Yeah, nice. So gang- yeah. And the gangster is probably in hindsight now you say, yeah, that's where I should have started. But in those days, if you said to someone, build me a 40 inch pit by 10 foot, they go, why? Yeah. But now we get to an event like meat stock and we backload that thing four times in two days to be able to keep up with the demand. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, so we've we've talked about your your involvement in the competition scene and um, some of the different uh, fun that you've had at, at, at some of those competitions. Tell us more about Black Iron Smokers, the business. Tell us about how how that came apart. Uh, came about, not apart. We don't want it to come apart. We want to, no, we don't want to come how apart. Did it, yeah. How did it come about? Um, as I say, we built the, built a couple, well, we built the first small trailer, um, and then we built the larger trailer and I had, I've got a best friend that I've known for years and years. He asked me to cater his son's 16th birthday party. Well, it was about 60 people. So, you know, we turned up, we did brisket and pork and ribs and all that sort of stuff. Um, somebody at that event then said, look, this is a, you know, this is really good. Can we get some barbecue, like not so much takeaway, but can you do something else for us? So we dropped some barbecue off for that. Then in the meantime, Kangaroo Valley is a barbecue competition popped up and hats off to Jay Beaumont because he suggested us as the, the barbecue vendor for the very first Kangaroo Valley. So we got involved with Peter Thompson down there and we went down there technically very, very groom. <laughs> so we turned up with copious amounts of wood, copious amounts of meat, copious amounts of salad and everything else and sold everything the first day, sort of blankly looked at each other and went, okay, hopefully we've got some more stuff for tomorrow. So dashed around, grabbed everything and then did it again. Um, so that's how we sort of started. And then slowly but surely um, we started to grow. So then Jay said to us, would you be able to come and cater a meat stock event for us? Nice invite. So if Kangaroo Valley was big, meat stock was twice as big, twice as scary. Um, So we got heavily involved in the catering thing. So then obviously there was meat stock Sydney, meat stock Melbourne. We did the um, Brisbane Barbecue Festival, Burley Barbecue Festival. Um, That And then obviously we've been to... To Melbourne a couple of times, we did one of the Yaks barbecue festivals down there as well. Uh, and it's just been a learning curve that everyone goes, oh, how much money do you think you're going to make this weekend at a barbecue festival? Mm. And I don't look at it on how much I'm prepared to make. It's how much I'm pre- prepared to lose if it all goes wrong. So if I'm looking at a barbecue festival like I am now, I've got a couple, of, I've got one coming up next week in Coffs. Um, for a, uh, it's a low rider car event that's on in Coffs Harbour. Awesome. Um, so I look at it and I go, okay, so I've got, you, you speak to the, to the proprietor and you go, how many people you got coming? So he'll tell you how many you've got. 
then you work out backwards through shrinkage and goodness knows what else you get through your meat. Then I've got to get it there. Then I've got to get my salads there. Then I've got to have a pool room up there. Um, where do I get, like in Sydney, where it's spoilt for choice, you know, where do I get simple things like chips or drinks or, you know, I've got a cousin that sells paper plates, but, you know, that catering sort of stuff that you use all the time. So you're not having to cut all of this product to where you go. So then you look at it and you go, okay, it's going to cost me X amount of money to attend this festival. If it all goes swimmingly, I, I could make X amount profit after that. But if it all goes the other way and it rains all weekend and we've had festivals that have been cancelled, mm. what, what are you going to, what, what sort of hit in the back pocket do you take if everything doesn't go as planned? So that, that's how we sort of measure what we do for events. Is that if it all goes swimmingly, yeah, that's great, and we can move on to the next event. Or if it all goes bad, that we haven't done our dough, so to speak, that you can keep trading moving forward. Yeah, that's a really unique uh, perspective on it. I've actually never heard anybody uh, sort of say that they measure them that way. Um, how did you arrive at that as your, as your method of, of calculating it? Um, we looked at, we did a, a, a couple of really, really good events. And so all of a sudden you get spoiled and you go, this is great. You know, <laughs> we just throw the marquee up and people line up forever and we just serve a barbecue and we go, sorry guys, sold out. You know, that that's that. Um, then we did an event and I won't name names. We did an event, a local event in Sydney and we were asked to do a thousand serves per day for two days. So we lined up for a thousand serves for the first day and sold oh. fifty burgers. Oh! So all of a sudden, I've got the the red trailer which you know, which had the vertical and had my, the, the pit that I built on it, and it's jam jam packed full of meat, half a dozen Cambros full of meat, and you go, where are the people? Oh! So then you start to calculate in your head what did that cost me. So it, it, I wouldn't say gun shy, but the old, my, one of my dad's favorite expressions is don't count your chickens before they hatch. Yep. So you have to hedge your bets. It's not that you go to an event and go, well, I'm going to be ultra conservative, but you cook, sell out, and then you go, that's cool, I can go again. Yep. But you don't overcommit. Mm, yeah, interesting. I was at a... Uh at an event a few years ago and I was actually staying overnight at the event and I had the unfortunate displeasure of helping one of the vendors there toss five grand's worth of pork ribs into the trash. Um, yeah, because it, it, it it's the same sort of thing. Cry. Yeah. 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 That was because just tragic. It's, it's um, what, what's the old, what's the old joke? How do you make a million dollars out of barbecue? You start with two million. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Now, this um something that I did really want to ask you was um for people like myself who are not vendors, I I don't have vending experience, but it's always something that I've sort of thought, oh, yeah, I could I could get, I could see myself get, maybe getting into that. There's a lot more involved than just I'm going to cook for 100 people, 500 people, 1000 people and just going and doing it. Can you take us through the process of a what would be a regular festival gig for you, sort of starting with you hang up the phone, you've confirmed it with the promoter. What happens after that and then take us through to the end? All right, so if we use, if I use Jay's event, say meat stock as an example. So Jay says meat stock's on, on X, X date. I've sold this amount of tickets. So then straight away I'd go, right, so he's sold X amount of tickets. I'm going to need... X amount of kilos of meat for that. So much salad, you know, pickles, all the other different things, all your consumables, all that sort of stuff. So you start to put the, the wheels in motion of ordering that sort of product and then logistically getting it to the site, being able to make sure it's temperature controlled the whole time, putting it into a cool room. Um, then the preparation around um, front of house, back of house staff, just people in general to, to help you out. Um, usually a couple of days before the event, I'll have a quick chat with Jay and go, how are ticket sales? He go, yep, they're off the charts, we're sold out. Um, 
confirming where you are on the day as far as has your site changed from last year. Um, in my case, with the with the gangster and with Jimmy Don, the new thousand gallon I've got, getting this getting the pit to site. Um, the gangster, you can't turn it on a dime. No. So we find, <laughs> apart from meat stock, we find that most of the events that we do, we're the first vendor on site and the last vendor off site, uh, just to get the pit in position, get it set up. Simple things like make sure the thing drains to the nose so you don't end up with a fat fire. Um, you know, just you know, have your floor down, have, have all your different marquees and different things set up. It's quite often that I'll drive the pit, Alinka will drive the red V-dub van that we've got with all the other consumable stuff that you take to an event. Um, Paul Wrightmore and I have had the conversation, you are physically tired before the event starts, let alone before you cut a piece of plastic. <laughs> and bet. then people go, oh, it must be great to do a barbecue event. What do you do on the Sunday night after you've cooked a meat stock? I'll go and find a Thai restaurant, or somewhere it serves ice cream or a good bourbon, the last thing I want to look at is another beef rib or a beef brisket or a pulled pork <laughs> burger. That, that's just, you know, no, we're going to move on. So so there's a lot that goes into the, uh, just into the general back of house stuff for an event before you before your customer walks up and goes, I'll have a, a taste plate or a table box or whatever it may be. You know, you're calculating how many you've got coming, down to, as I say, having enough staff to be able to say, well, I've got enough beef rib to be able to get through for a day. And then you might get the, in a good fortune, say for, for someone like myself, but one of your other vendors might run out for some reason. So then all of a sudden you go, okay, well, I've equated for 500 serves today, but vendor ABC up the road here has run out for whatever reason. Then all those people get off, off his line and they just they deposit themselves on your line or someone else's line. So all of a sudden you go that 500 or 700 serves, whatever it may be, then cuts down to, you know, it cuts down the amount of food you actually put out. Yeah, right. Now I've, I've actually we'll, just, um, sorry, go ahead. But we'll change our menu up if need be, because with something like a meat stock, the last, as Jay said, it's not a good look if things are sold out. So you'll start with full menu, which might be six or seven items in our case. And at the end of the day on a Sunday, someone walks up and goes, I want a beef rib. And you go, mate, that was 11 o'clock this morning. How about a brisket burger? Because that's <laughs> yeah. all I've got left. So you yeah. tailor your menu as you go. Yeah, right, right. Um, I, I was just uh, taking notes as you were talking. And I, came, I, I have a question here. So when uh, the, the promoter um, in, in the meat stock example, of course, that, that's Jay, when they ring and say, we've sold this many tickets, in your head, do you divide that number by how many vendors you know are going to be there? Like, do you say, okay, yes. it's, it's, it's 10,000 divided by six, or do you look at the vendors and go, oh, well, I know that my stuff's better than him, so I'm going to attract more people, so I'll, like, do you play no, with the percentages I, of that, or is it a straight it, split? I don't look at it that way. I, if Jay says we've got 15 vendors, there's 15,000 tickets sold, I look at it and go, well, if it's a one-day event or a two-day event like meat stock, I should be doing 1,000 serves of that. Um, it, I never look at it that my queue is any better than anybody else's. That's just the way I was raised. Um, I leave that up to the punter to decide whether he wants to buy from us or somebody else. Um, if on the day that they deem, yeah, we've got a, an offering that is appealing to a customer and we oversell for that day, okay, then we've got to run around like crazy people at the end of the day and go, yeah, I need another 15 boxes of beef ribs or whatever it is. But I look at, as you say, I look at it and Jay goes, okay, there might be 15,000 people for meat stock. You're pretty much looking at a thousand. So that's how I look at it. And yeah, then I look right. at it and go, well, if I can do a thousand serves a queue in a day or in two days, yeah, all good. Yeah. That's a, that's a very tidy, uh, very tidy amount of meat going out there. Um, so what are some of the highs and lows that, that you've experienced as a, as a vendor and, Tell us the lows first so we finish on a positive note. Um, the lows would have been the um, would have been the Sydney event that we got really geared up for and it was going to be the biggest thing. And look, in his in his defense, he did, he promoted it pretty well. The weather didn't really play the game. 
And for whatever reason, you know, I want you to do a thousand serves a day. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. No problem. But then you turn up there and he doesn't, he, that was the one thing. He didn't tell us that there was 26 other vendors. 26. Yeah. So I sort of drove the, the old trailer and I went, okay, this is going to be really full on. Yeah. And when you sell 50 burgers the first day, you can ask Olinka when you see her next. I literally hooked the trailer on at about seven o'clock because the event closed at 6.30. And he said, you won't be able to get your trailer out yet because security haven't opened the gate. And I said, that's fine. I've got bolt cutters. I'm out of here, bloke. We're done. <laughs> I was going to um, ask, did you go back for the second day? No. And he, he rang me two years later and he said, what do you think? I said, I don't think anything. I said, you're a great guy. I said, but I'm just not prepared to take that risk again. Um, then you switch it up to something like Kangaroo Valley, a meat stock or Burley barbecue. Um, the last, I think it was 2019, we did Burley barbecue last because last year all that strange stuff happened and then the Gold Coast decided they wanted to put that U-Butte light rail in down to, to North Burley. So Greg said, no, we're not going to do it this year. Okay. The last year we did Burley barbecue um, was I have never sold so much barbecue in a day as we did in two days up there. Awesome. It was just, it, it just seems to work because there's no, you've got to pay X amount to come in or anything. The people just turn up and they just turn up and they line up. I said to one guy, how long have you been standing here? He goes, oh, 40 minutes. And Olinka was coming back from getting something from one of the other cool rooms that we had. And there was a guy standing on the end of the line and he said, excuse me. And she said, yeah, he goes, what am I lined up for? <laughs> and she goes, you're on the end of our barbecue line. Like we're, we're serving food. And he went, oh, okay. I just saw all these people st standing here. So I thought I'd just stand here with them. So he ended up buying barbecue off us. It was crazy. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right. So now tell me about the future for, uh, for Black Iron Smokers because I know you've got a couple of uh, – Irons in the fire, so to speak. What are you working on? A um, couple of things for us is before last year happened and the journey popped out of the bottle, we were sort of looking, not sort of, we were looking more to go. Um, we still want to do our event catering, don't get me wrong, but I want to find somewhere that's black iron smokers on it. So I want to be able to ring you up and say, hey, Ben, come down, let's have a bourbon at the bar. We'll get you some good cue. And by the way, do you want to buy the latest rub that I just got in from wherever it is? It's in the other side of the shop. Um, yeah. So that's that's something that Alinka and I are looking at long term is to to do that whole bricks and mortar thing. I don't want to be a, for want of a better word, Rudy's Barbecue in the US where they're everywhere and all over the place. I just want to have one really nice barbecue place. Um, you know, not quintessentially snows because there's only one snows, but something like that where people just turn up. If they want to buy my barbecue, that's where they come. And, and then they can still see the location. At, yeah, that's right. At our festivals and, and do what we normally do. Um, the other thing that's just become like self perpetuating and, and generic, which has probably surprised me more than anything, is that we've been asked to build some barbecue pits for people. Oh, really? So um, when I originally commissioned the name Black Iron Smokers and Barbecue, I thought, well, yeah, okay, it's just Black Iron Smokers and Barbecue. The Black Iron Smokers part of it seems to, in the last three to four months, have had the phone ring a couple of times and someone goes, saw your big pit you're building on the driveway. How much is one of those? Where do I get it from? Wow. Could you do one for me? Um, so it's just become self perpetuating to the point that I actually build one in the garage at the moment for a customer. Um, it's I'm certainly not going to be a, a Silver Creek or a or, um, Dave Close or anything like that because that's that's not my thing. Um, but it'll be a, a one off here and there boutique pit that somebody wants. Um, my background for some people that don't know me is I'm a builder and furniture maker by trade. Ah. So if you said to me, Andrew, I want you to build me a grand piano, can I do that? Yeah, I can. That, that's my background. 
Awesome. Um, so I've had several long conversations with a Mr. Paul Reitmeyer on, but metal is really weird and it does this. And he goes, yeah, and I find the same thing about wood. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's an applied thing because I've, I've got a trade background, but steel to me is still pretty foreign. I'm, I'm learning as I go. I learned a lot when I built Jimmy Don, the big pit on the driveway. Um, but it's something that I'm passionate about and anything that I do, um, my OCD pops up pretty heavily to make sure that it's as good a product as I can possibly produce to put out. Itself. Yeah. Sounds good, mate. Sounds good. Now that, that job as a, uh, sorry, the, the background as a, as a builder and furniture maker, you don't still have a, like a full-time day job, do you? I do. I've got a full-time day job. I'm actually in sales. You're nuts. So it's one of those things that, yeah, you want to step out on the water and do this full time. Um, I was always raised that, you know, everyone's got the quintessential home loan. Everyone's got the quintessential car loan. That's they're, they're your two largest purchases that pretty much everyone makes. Um, I was always raised that my dad's my dad's eighty eight lives in Coffs Harbour. Did my trade with him. I'm a third generation um, cabinet maker and, and builder. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's it. Um, so when I was doing my trade with my dad, his favorite expression was, if you don't have the money, don't buy it. So with everything that we do in barbecue, um, you know, like all the stuff that we've got, we make sure that there's a lot of brisket sandwiches. That's all how I can put it. There's a lot of brisket sandwiches sitting on my driveway to pay for everything that we've got. So we're very probably over cautious where a lot of people will just jump in the pond and start to swim. But I'm always of the, um, probably of the idea that if something happens like happened last year and you're quintessentially three quarters of a mile down the road into a mile journey, how do you get back to square one or how do you, how do you stop the inevitable of the house of cards falling over? So people who know me know that I'm fairly conservative in that I dream really big and I've got some really scary things. I think it looks at me sometimes and goes, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but that's just the way I am. But then it's also tempered by the fact that I look at things and go, well, if it doesn't all go to plan, how do I keep moving forward without, you know, any, any major issues? And long story short, um, what are we in 2020 now in, 1991, I committed $550,000 into a prawn trawler and did that for 10 years. Wow. And that was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so they say when you jump in the deep end of the pond, for the first six weeks of, of that particular career, I thought I was going to die because I had seasickness for six weeks. <laughs> so once bitten, twice shy that if we're going to go bricks and mortar, we're going to make sure that's a nice, steady progression. We're not Jumping off the end of any jetties this time, this point. <laughs> so, so you weren't even a sailor, and you and you bought a a, a prawn no, trawler. No, just, just don't go there, okay? <laughs> I, I can still remember laying on the deck in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning, going, "What have you done?" <laughs> you know, everyone talks about Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers, mate. It's got nothing on seasickness for six weeks. I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that. That sort of instilled in me then that whilst you can have all these great ideas and everything seems to be rosy at the time, when you actually start to live that, that dream, you really need to be passionate about it. And to, to follow up on something that you interviewed with Paul the other day about that, is that I'm passionate about barbecue and it's about traditional barbecue. So if I, we've been to the States and we've spoken to lots of people about the way they do things and why they do things, um, I want to put out the best cue that I can every time that somebody walks up to get a, a burger off me. Um, and that's just, how do I put it? Just the way I'm wired that if I'm going to go into something, I go into it 100% and I do it to the absolute best of my ability. That's just the way that, that we're wired. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. 
All righty, Andrew. Now, I'm having an absolute ball here, but this is uh, now segment three. So this is the, the, the part of the show where you give our, our viewers and our listeners a bit of a lesson on a particular aspect of what you do that you feel you are a real expert in. And also for the viewers who are joining us live, now's the time to start putting those questions in the comments because after we've had our lesson, then we'll jump into the Q&A. And if you are watching the, the, uh, the public release of this, uh, if you would like to watch the full extended version of, of this uh, podcast, uh, you'll need to jump over onto smoking, uh, sorry, patreon.com slash smoking hot confessions and jo- uh, take out a membership there because the, the public um, releases, I'm limited to an hour, unfortunately. So, Andrew, it's your turn, my friend. What, uh, what wisdom are you going to share with us today? Um, as I said to you, Ben, I'm pretty much a traditional stick burner kind of guy. Everything that we do is on a stick burner. Um, so my big thing for me is to run that stick burner efficiently, whether you're cooking a brisket or whether you're cooking a beef rib or whatever it may be. Um, I'm a traditional low and slow kind of guy. So if I'm going to do a brisket per se, if I don't have 12 hours to devote to that piece of meat, and let's be honest, if you go and buy a brisket these days, they're well in excess of a hundred odd dollars, then um, don't cut the plastic. If you haven't <laughs> got eight or 10 hours to devote to something, then just go, okay, that's cool. I'll do chicken or I'll do fish or do something you've got time to be able to do rather than have the entire family turn up at 4 p.m. and you go, well, sorry, I overslept and it's been really wet and I haven't been able to hold temp in the pit and everyone's looking at each other at 11.30 going, KFCs are really good up here. Yeah, Uh, Uber Eats, DoorDash, yeah. That's right. (laughs) So for me, if you're going to run a stick burner and you're going to put a brisket on it, then devote the time that you've got to it. And simple things like make sure that you've got that good clean but don't, uh, good clean burn. Don't just prep your meat, throw it on while the fire's main to, like just sort of starting. If I'm going to light the gangster for a brisket, which I kind of do for occasion, um, get a good coal bed established. So go out, spend some time with your smoker, get it clean, get it set up. Um, obviously, with things like stick burners, the wind, for example, will be a big thing in something like the size that we've got. It'll blow temperature off a pit in five minutes flat. So wow. no, get to know your pit a bit. Um, if you've got a patio pit and you're thinking, okay, well, it's a really windy day, orientate it somewhere to about 10 or 15 degrees off the wind so that the, the airflow has actually been blown into the firebox. It's always easier to neck a pit down than it is to try and, if you've got your pit running at 100%, you can't get any more than that. So simple tips like that. And then maintain that temperature i know when i first started it was like it's got to be 225 um all the silver creeks i cook on they just run at 250 it just seems to be you know when you get in your car and you drive down the highway it settles down at a speed and you go okay that's cool the silver creeks i've got the uh, the really big pit i've got they just seem to run at 250 so 250 fahrenheit get it set up get it hot put your meat in as Tootsie Tomines said to us when we did his snows, she just cracks a lone star and she goes, if it's not ready in eight hours, crack. She goes, just wait a bit longer. <laughs> and, you know, it just, everyone has to start somewhere. And there's lots of keyboard warriors and there's lots of um, armchair critics that'll tell you, you know, oh, that's not right and that's not right. Just jump in the pond and have a go. At the end of the day, even, you know, bad barbecue, well, I wouldn't show bad barbecue, but if, if you start now, barbecue, even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. But if you go back to the, the vernacular of turning sausages on, on a gas up, if you're going to put the time into a brisket and, you know, whether you decide whether you want to inject, um, a lot of guys will, you know, I, I, I do a barbecue class at one of the local breweries and these guys turn up with these rubs and they go, and they walk in with a box put it down and they go what do you think and i go dude you brought your pantry like seriously <laughs> and they go what do you put on yours i said salt pepper and garlic and they go no nah. and i go yeah and they said but mine doesn't taste like yours and i said but how quickly do you cook it? i did it in four hours okay 
So then you you start to work walking through the process of when you took the brisket out of the plastic, what did you do with it? I trimmed all the fat off. Are you going to put it in a box for competition cook? Well, no, but I saw that on YouTube and that's the way you do it. Okay, so let's leave some fat on the brisket. I'm a fat cat up kind of guy. Um, I remember listening to a guy in Melbourne at the Axe Barbecue Festival and every second word out of his mouth was, remember to put the fat cap up. Do whatever you like to put the fat cap up. So that's just the way I cook a brisket. Um, my theory is that the fat will render, draw that rub, salt, pepper and garlic, whatever you decide to put on it, draw it in and then let it permeate the meat as it goes. Um, but just take your time. And at the end of the day, have a go. Like literally turn up at your local butcher shop and go, mate, I want a brisket or I want a beef rib. If you're not that confident to jump in the pond, let it do a really good pull pork. Inject that thing with some pink Moscato or whatever it might be, spritz it just to get that real sticky bark on the outside, wrap it up and, you know, away you go. So just literally get in and have a go. And mm. there's no such thing as um, not, I shouldn't say not doing it right, for want of a better way of putting it, but learn from your mistakes. I can remember one of the first racks of beef ribs I, I cooked, I looked at it and went, yeah, they're not supposed to look like that. <laughs> and the family's sitting on the back deck, mind you, and they're all oh. I've opened. That was the only set of beef ribs I've wrapped in my entire life. And I've opened the foil up and gone, okay, so let's slice the brisket and literally just push them off the side of the bench into the sink. <laughs> my father-in-law said, what went in the sink? I said, nothing. Would you like another beer? And started to slice the brisket. <laughs> There's no way I was going to serve that. To so you know, if, if you make a mistake, have another go. That, that's half the fun of barbecue, especially low and slow. You've got, it brings people together. And that's what I love about it is that we go to a barbecue event. I remember Bangalore. You would have been to the Bangalore event. Several times. You sit yeah. down at Bangalore. Everyone has a coffee or a beer or a bourbon or whatever it is. It's three degrees and you're all sitting around just talking. The kids are running around playing on the hay bales. That's what barbecue to me is about. It's that quintessential Let's get together and share food. Sharing food brings people together. Mm, yeah, and just to sort of build on that on that point that you just made there, you mentioned before that uh, you know um, spending that time and then you get your final product, and you know even even not great barbecue is still pretty good. For me, it's not even about the end product. For me, if I'm going to spend the day on my stick burner, it's because I want a day off. I want a Correct. day off of my regular life. I want to sit yep. out in the backyard. I want to hang out um, w with my dog. I want to have a couple of beers. I want to listen to the music that I want to listen to. I want to listen to the podcast that I want to listen to. And I want to play with a fire. And if at the end of that great day that I get to spend doing what I want to do, then yep. I get some good barbecue or then I even get some mediocre barbecue. I don't even really care because I've had that great day and it's such a mental health sort of stress reliever just to get out there and just do that. Um, so I, I think that's a really good point to make there as well. Look, it is some of the, the best times I've had in barbecue, and it sounds really bizarre, is at 2 o'clock in the morning at a major festival when you know 15,000 people are going to charge through the gate the next morning, but you're literally sitting there, everything's either wrapped or just ticking over, just, just coming down the straight to wrap or whatever it may be, and you're literally sitting there, as you say, with a beer, few tunes going in the background and you just open the firebox door, throw a log on, close it up and just sit there and just relax, look at the stars and go, yeah, this is a pretty cool job. Not bad at all, man. Not bad at all. All right. So this is probably a, um, a bit of a good point now for us to, uh, to start wrapping up the episode. So I'm going to throw the studio open to you now. So give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout outs and tell everybody where they can follow Black Iron Smokers on the internet. Um, Black Iron Smokers, obviously we've got the Facebook and um, internet. We'll be looking at a website at some stage soon. Um, big thanks has got to go to um, Paul Reitmeyer. The guy's as honest as the day is long. And without his pits and his advice from the early get-go of what we do, I wouldn't produce the barbecue that I do. And in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, he builds the best stick burners in the country. Um, Jay Beaumont, like without Jay Beaumont, black iron smokers wouldn't have been pushed in the deep end of the pool and taught to swim. 
and he just flat knows how to run an event. Obviously, um, Greg Dean, same sort of thing. We've worked with Julian on the Gold Coast uh, in, and in Brisbane. Same same thing there. Um, now, I, are you? Uh, did you remember to to, to thank Alinka? Well, without Alinka, <laughs> there, there would not be black iron smokers. Um, because everything that I do is, as I say, I'm a black iron smoker, but without her, then yeah, I just I don't move forward. Um, it's it's just it, yeah. She's she's my right hand in what we do. So we sit down for each event, and we look at what we do and how we do it, why we do it. Uh, those of me, those of you who know me pretty well, I've got her tattooed on this arm. So she's with me oh. every day. So if I'm in the state or if I'm on the other side of the world and whatever, if I travel for work overseas, I um I carry her with me everywhere. You can see. Oh that. wow! It's it it's not even just her name. It's an actual like like picture of oh, her tattooed, her. tattooed yeah. down your entire upper arm. That's awesome. That's right. So um that was a that was a bit of a rookie error. I got that done, and then the next day I went and did a barbecue comp. And anyone who's had a tat knows how tender you are the next day. So people are like, how are you going today? And I'm like, yeah, great. I'm just doing everything with my right hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I can so, yeah, just see you trying to, trying to throw, those, uh, throw those doors up on the, on the gangster with one arm. That's that's right. <laughs> it. it's, um, it's certainly, it's, it makes me smile to think that, you know, there's a lot of people in catering and what we do and how we do it, but there's very, very few husband and wife barbecue caterers. Mm. You know, and I'm at the back of the house and I'm slinging meat and I'm trimming this and I'm rubbing that and I'm doing this and she's the face of what goes on at the front. So she gets the customer that goes, no, I don't want to pickle on that and can I have extra sauce and can I have an extra handful of chips? So she does all of that sort of stuff. Um, I quite regularly call her the Minister for Finance because she does all of that side of the stuff. I just I get the easy bit, mate. I get to the, get the throw wood in, in the barbecue. And, uh, and cook meat. All right, look, man, thank yeah. you very much for, for coming on board tonight. I realise that we are in different time zones and it's getting super late for you, so I do appreciate you uh, you coming on board the show and sharing this with us. I've had an absolute ball. I don't think I've had this much fun in quite a while, so thank you very much. And, no, uh, I appreciate I'd, it, man. And I'd, I look forward to seeing you again real soon. You will. Mate, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And, uh, yeah, let's uh, just go out there and do some more Q. <laughs> All righty, there you have it, family. That was Andrew Don Patterson from Black Iron Smokers and Barbecue. How cool is that guy? He's hilarious. How funny was that? He, he he's not a sailor, but he bought a uh, a, a shrimping boat. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, uh, so check him out. He he does some beautiful work. As I said, I've been following him around for a couple of years. We first met at Kangaroo Valley. I've seen him um, in Sydney. I've seen him in Melbourne. Um, we, we've heard him talk today about going down to Tasmania and across to Adelaide. I mean, the guy loves his barbecue and he's still working a full-time job. So he's doing all this on top of a full-time job. The man is an absolute barbecue maniac. So do yourself a favor, check him out, grab some of his food. It's fantastic stuff. All right, now before I do let you go, because we are running out of time tonight, some quick reminders. Winter is coming. Grab yourself a Smoking Hot Confessions hoodie and a beanie off of our website, smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. While you're there, check out the free ebook that's available to you. It's the real beginner at uh, the real beginner. It's the beginner's guide to real barbecue. I'm on messing up all my words tonight. This is embarrassing. We've got Barbicon coming up for you in June, which is going to be a fantastic experience. The world's first virtual barbecue conference, uh, 26th and 27th of June. Keep that weekend free. We've got the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community over on Facebook. So to, to everyone who's joined us live tonight for this podcast recording, thank you very much. We've really appreciated all your comments and questions coming through for Andrew and myself. If you are watching on YouTube, do give us the thumbs up, the subscribe, and the notification bell. If you're watching on Facebook, it's the likes, the shares, the comments, and a follow. IGTV, we love those cute little love hearts and a follow. And if you are listening on a podcast app, particularly if it's Apple Podcasts, do just take 30 seconds of your time and give us a five-star rating and review. It's super helpful. And as I did say at the top of the show, it has pushed us as high in the last 30 days as number six on the US chart. So we want to try and stay as high up there as we can. So if you could help us out, we would love that very much. Thank you very much. And that is literally all the time that I do have for you tonight. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. 
Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. Yeah.